So Dragon Ball Super is finally over, except not really because we're going to get another movie in December and we're probably going to get a follow-up series sometime probably late spring to early summer of 2019, meaning that the pain has only stopped for the time being, the cancerous infection has yet to settle in. That's going to come later down the line. Um, but in all seriousness, the upcoming movie does look really interesting. I'm so happy we have finally new designs. I'm glad that someone at Toei realized, hey guys, Dragon Ball has looked almost the exact fucking same for almost 20 years now. If we're gonna do a new movie that's also the 20th Dragon Ball movie, maybe we should update the designs. And... To give the movie credit before I get on to reviewing the actual finale, they talk about how they've been working with Toriyama concerning the designs. A lot of people are really excited because we're getting the manga colors uh, for Goku and presumably all the other characters. I don't really care either way. I can take or leave the manga colors. I, I like both versions or whatever. Uh, the storyline is most definitely going to be a piece of shit because it's going to be about the Saiyans and Frieza and probably the Saiyan's relationship with Frieza, and Yamosh is probably going to show up. So I expect nothing but awfulness from the narrative side, but big thumbs up for creating really good visual spectacle. But that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is reviewing the finale. And this is kind of a mixed bag, because the first half of this is legitimately really, really good. In fact, I would say that the first half of this is probably one of the finest examples and one of the few examples where both the writing and the spectacle of Dragon Ball Super come together and create something genuinely interesting and genuinely worthwhile. Because Super is, by and large, narratively completely awful on multiple different levels. The show consistently just breaks some of the most basic rules of writing and is all majoritively just terrible on a narrative perspective, even if the spectacle has dramatically improved thanks to a lot of cool Sakuga stuff in this arc in particular. But the first half of this is a really good example of how when you combine narrative and spectacle, you will make something infinitely more worthwhile and memorable and interesting for your audience than just dumb spectacle that looks cool. That's kind of the big problem I have with episode 130, 130, where it looks really cool, but I just don't give a shit about anything that's happening or the people involved in it, and so it's just pretty noise. Whereas the first half of this has some really legitimately interesting stuff. And a lot of that comes from the pairings that are being created here. Uh, it all really comes down to Goku and Frieza for me. Because Goku and Frieza team up legitimately for the first time in this entire tournament. Frieza has cooperated with them in like group efforts. He's helped Goku out on a few instances, but Goku and Frieza throughout this entire tournament and throughout the vast majority of the series, not counting stuff like video games and that stuff, these guys have never really stopped and just worked together. And so just seeing that happen was really, really interesting. But the thing that makes it narratively so satisfying is the moment where... Uh, they do something that I didn't think they would ever be able to pull off. And that's they create really good context and reasoning for why Goku and Frieza cooperate with one another that stays true to both of their characters. A lot of people have been speculating about Frieza potentially going the route of Piccolo and him Shinhan and Vegeta and becoming more of a good guy, and I don't like that because one of the things about Frieza is that Frieza is completely unrepentantly evil. He is completely unrepentantly egotistic. He is just a rotten son of a bitch, and that makes him inherently different from even Piccolo and Vegeta, who had at least some things about them that made them different. Frieza is just an all-around bastard, and I do not ever want him to become a best pal of Goku's the same way Piccolo, Vegeta, and Ten Shinhan have. But what they do here is probably one of the finest examples of writing in the entire Dragon Ball franchise, I would say, because Goku and Frieza are able to trust and cooperate with one another because of who they are. Frieza asks Goku, hey, you're gonna revive me when this is over, 
And Goku basically tells him, yeah, I'm going to do that, but you have to actually stick to your word for once. And these guys trust each other because they know who they are. Frieza knows that Goku is a naive idiot who's going to do him a solid because he promised to do it. And Goku knows that Frieza is not going to screw him over because Goku is his only chance of coming back to life. And he knows that Frieza is so selfish and self-serving that he will lower himself to cooperate with him just so he can come back to life. And that's a really great bit of writing. And what's especially impressive is that they do it in a really subtle way. They don't beat you over the head with it the way they do the Jiren Topo speech. They don't do it in the way they do it with episode 130 where everyone is just spouting the most generic Mai Nakama shonen bullshit of all time ever. They just do it in a really, really subtle way that gets the point across, but if you want to get the true depth of the conversation, you have to put in some thought into it. And what results is probably one of my favorite fights in the entire tournament. It's not particularly mega impressive, but like I said, because the narrative makes you actually give a fuck beyond the most superficial of possible levels, it immediately makes everything considerably more interesting. And the final shot of it, where it's Super Saiyan Goku and Final Form Frieza taking out Jiren, is probably going to go down, for good reason in my opinion, as probably an iconic shot for the franchise in the years moving forward. And... After they fucked up Ultra Instinct, I was convinced they were going to destroy everything with Frieza. Because in the episodes leading up to this, Frieza was being given the, the Dynasty Warriors treatment, I want to say. And what I mean by that is, we have a single beat with Frieza, and they repeat it over and over and over and over again, in the same way they repeated it five times with Vegeta. If Vegeta has... 10 freaking Manakama speeches over the span of 5 episodes, Frieza has 10 instances of showing up for no good reason, just so Jiren or Topo can beat him up, and he can just get knocked out of the story again. And that was making me really, really nervous about what the hell was going to happen with Frieza. So, in this heaping shit pile of a story arc, Frieza actually comes out of it being the be not only the best part of the whole thing, but the one part that they start off really well and they actually conclude it in a satisfactory way. I would have liked to see Frieza win because I think that would have been an insanely interesting ending, but the what they've been able to pull off is equally impressive and worthy of actual praise. The problems come in with the second part of the episode where... The focus, once again, kind of goes to Android 17 and what is his wish. And there are quite a few problems with this that are kind of symptomatic of the rest of the arc. This arc, and kind of Super as a whole, has this thing where they give characters really weird motivations and reasons for doing things that don't really make any sense. And Android 17 is one of those guys. Like... Android 17 in this arc is supposed to be kind of going through something like a character arc where his interactions with Goku and company are making him more human and empathetic, I guess. Which doesn't really make sense because 17, even in the Android arc, he was always kind of like the most human of all the androids. He's the guy who says, I know we, kn I know, we know where Goku lives or where he could be hiding out and we could just go there and kill him in like five minutes. But instead of doing that... Why don't we steal a bitching ass car and go for an awesome road trip? And the story even stops to comment on that, that 17 is kind of like the most human of all of them. And so at the beginning of this arc, when 17 apparently doesn't care about his family or nature enough to participate in the tournament, he, he changes his mind because he's going to get a boat. So you don't care about your family or the nature preserve you've been defending for probably over a decade at this point to join them in the Tournament of Power to possibly save their lives, but you care about getting a boat so you can take your family on cruises with them. It's It was really fucking stupid when they did it back then, and calling back to it here 
through Android 18 is probably one of the worst things ever put in the Dragon Ball franchise because when he makes the wish, Android 18 looks actually distraught and kind of worried where she tells him, are you sure you don't want to revive trillions of people? Are you sure you don't just want to wish for a boat? And if they did that with like their Android arc sarcasm where they know it's dumb, but they're just kind of doing it because that's their thing in a sarcastic manner, that would have made it a really cute moment. It would have even made it a little bit self-aware in a cool way where they know that the boat motivation is really stupid so that you're having the characters poke fun at it. But Android 17 plays it straight. 18 plays it straight up. She is legitimately worried if her brother is okay for not getting a fucking boat Instead, choosing to revive trillions of people across multiple galaxies and universes. That is easily one of the stupidest bits of character writing in Dragon Ball history. In fact, it might be one of the stupidest bits of character writing I've ever seen in fiction, period. It is so absolutely ridiculous. And the whole boat thing, like I said, is a stupid motivation. Why the fuck do you have to tell Seventeen you're going to use the Super Dragon Balls to get him the boat? I'm pretty sure Bulma already tells everyone that if they work for them in this tournament, she's going to pay them all a shitload of money. So just have Goku tell Seventeen, hey man, I know someone who's loaded. She can get you a boat like in five minutes. So you're going to do it? There's no fucking reason for this to be a plot point. And the fact that the series brings it back to unironically use it as like the resolution of a 17 is now more human than ever character arc is just bizarre. It doesn't work. And Android 17 as a character, I know a lot of people really like him and I'm not going to deny he's done some really cool shit in this tournament, but I didn't really care for him in the Android arc and I don't really care for him here. Not just because of the stupid wonkiness concerning how his character starts out and where they kind of leave him off as in relation to previous material, I just don't find him that interesting. He doesn't really have an interesting power set. Um, he doesn't really have that interesting of a personality. Uh, yeah, the dry, like, sarcastic humor is entertaining at points, and they do get some legitimate laughs out of me for there. But kind of like with Future Trunks, I feel like... He's an old character who's being brought back, and so the anime staff felt obliged to insert him into everything ever, into all these big moments, just for that sake alone. Fuck, I'm surprised Android 17 didn't get a transformation or some shit, the same way Future Trunks gets Super Saiyan Rage, which is still never explained. And I'm legitimately surprised they didn't reveal that 17 has like a super Android 17 mode or some shit. The way they've been kind of filleting him throughout this entire arc. But the wonky character writing does not end there. It goes to Zeno. And I don't know what Zeno is anymore. Because throughout the vast majority of the time, Zeno has been kind of portrayed the same way Fat Boo was in the early parts of the Boo Saga, where he is this ultra-powerful child who doesn't really know what morality is, he doesn't really understand what he's doing when he's killing people and destroying things, and he's kind of like that, except on a much bigger scale. And throughout the entire arc, and throughout the entire series, since he's shown up, they've really hammered that home, where Zeno is precisely dangerous because he does not grasp the full scope of what he is doing. He will kill you, and without a second thought, and he'll never understand that he's, you know, killed another thinking, feeling person because we're all just insignificant gnats to him. And the way they characterize him throughout all of, throughout all of his appearances up until this episode is that he is amoral and all that kind of stuff. But now they try to play him off as someone who knows that people feel stuff and he wanted to use this tournament as like a test of character to see that if someone made a selfish wish, Zeno would have killed absolutely everybody. But what the fuck does that have to do with anything? Like, where is this motivation coming from? And 
even in the early parts of the arc where they talk about, oh, Zeno is worried about the development of universes, and that's like the bar that's being used to judge who's going to be in the tournament and who isn't going to be in the tournament. Already I thought, well, why does Zeno care about that stuff? That doesn't make any sense with the way you have presented him thus far, and neither does this. Zeno being like this kind of trickster, I want to say who wanted to, like, teach people maybe a lesson, it feels really, really weird, and I don't know where it's coming from. A lot of people want to talk about how, oh, Zeno has seen the strength of mortals or the strength of humans, and he has learned throughout this entire tournament what the strength of humanity is and what their worth is. And I'm just like, that doesn't work. Because this tournament is not a test of fucking character. It is a test of who can punch the hardest. Nothing in this tournament is a test of character. It is literally just people beating the ever-loving shit out of each other until there's someone left standing amidst the ruins. And, and the few things that are about the strength of characters is about power. Vegeta's whole shtick five times over is Manakama gives me a power boost. That's it. That does not have anything to do with the strength of humans or anything. I don't understand how being able to punch the hardest is like a test of character or that's going to teach you how strong humans are beyond, you know, a power level. How's that going to teach you about the strength of human fortitude and that kind of stuff? It's really wonky. It doesn't make any sense, and it certainly doesn't jive with the way Zeno was characterized beforehand. Once again, I feel like they wanted to do something with Zeno the way Fat Boo did, where Zeno interacts with humans and he gains his own humanity as a consequence. But Zeno has never interacted with humanity. He doesn't interact with almost anybody. He never interacts with Goku. There's never an episode where he and Goku are just on Earth and Goku is showing him around. Hey, this is ice cream. Hey, it's not okay to hurt people. There's no episode like that. And so Zeno just suddenly caring about morality and the worth of mortals it comes right the fuck out of nowhere. It makes no freaking sense. And that's another reason why the, the second half of the finale is just really wonky and really, really stupid from a narrative perspective. And then we get, you know, the ending. You know, everyone's at the party because every arc has to end with a party. They're all having a good time. They're all celebrating. We get a couple cool, funny shots. Goku and Vegeta do the Saiyan arc poses because we got to jerk off the Fantards one more time before we leave off. Frieza hastily rebuilds his empire and goes about his evil ways. And that's more or less the ending of that. So... Yeah, like, I, like you can probably see in my thumbnail, this is a true mixed bag. The first half of this has some really damn good writing, and probably some of the best writing in the franchise, while the second half is just a big load of dumb bullshit that's kind of symptomatic of the writing for the vast majority of not just the survival arc, but also Dragon Ball Super as a whole. And so... I really wish they were able to unfuck the second half. I really wish I was just able to enjoy and love this finale completely the way I do the first half. But because of the bullshit concerning Seventeen and Zeno and the twist, quote-unquote, it doesn't work entirely. I will say this is a better conclusion than Goku just flying off with Oob as it was in the original Dragon Ball manga and in the Z anime. Because that's not really an ending. I mean, kind of is an open one where Goku apparently goes on even more adventures that we don't see. And the adventures of the series keep going on and on and on past the scope of what we will ever witness. And I understand why people feel that kind of thematically fits. I even sort of agree to a point. But it's not really a satisfying conclusion for me, if you ask me. And... I would also say the, the GT ending is better for a couple different reasons. I like how experimental the GT ending was, where there's a lot of abstract concepts at play, where you don't really know what's going on with Goku. It's a very strange way to conclude the series, but I really like it because it's kind of taking a risk at the end. And I also like it because 
it's a definitive conclusion. It says that the story of Goku and Bulma and all these people is over. We're not going to get any more of it. Now, please, fuck off and find something else to waste your worthless lives on. I appreciate that. I appreciate an ending that just slams it on the fucking table and says, we're done. And so that kind of puts the super ending as like the second best, I want to say, ending. So I would probably say GT is still the best one because the emotions run high. Yes, there is some wonkiness even in that episode, but a lot of it is kind of like intentional because they intentionally want you to think about where Goku's going. What does this mean? What does that mean? And that gives it a lot more leeway than the wonkiness concerning Zeno and 17. And also it's a definitive ending. I would probably put this as like the second best one and just for the strength of the first 10 to 12 minutes. And then, of course, the Oob ending where he and Goku just fly off. So those are my thoughts on the finale of the Universe Survival Arc and Dragon Ball Super for now. What are your thoughts on the finale? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you agree with my sentiments? Do you disagree? Please comment down below and I'll see you next time. Bye.